We stop looking for monsters under our beds when we realize they are inside us. I see no good reasons why the views given in this volume should shock the religious views of anyone. A man who dares to waste one hour of time has not discovered the value of life. Man in his arrogance thinks himself a great work, worthy of the interposition of a deity. More humble, and I believe truer, to consider him created from animals. False facts are highly injurious to the progress of science, for they often endure long. But false views, if supported by some evidence, do little harm, for everyone takes a salutary pleasure in proving their falseness. Englishmen rarely cry, except under the pressure of the acutest grief, whereas in some parts of the continent the men shed tears much more readily and freely. Natural selection almost inevitably causes much extinction of the less improved forms of life and induces what I have called divergence of character. Sexual selection acts in a less rigorous manner than natural selection. The latter produces its effects by the life or death at all ages of the more or less successful individuals. A fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. It is difficult to believe in the dreadful but quiet war lurking just below the serene facade of nature. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little, not those who know much, who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. For the shield may be as important for victory as the sword or spear. A grain in the balance will determine which individual shall live and which shall die, which variety or species shall increase in number, and which shall decrease or finally become extinct. It is necessary to look forward to a harvest, however distant that may be, when some fruit will be reaped, some good effected. If the misery of the poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions, great is our sin. There is no fundamental difference between man and animals in their ability to feel pleasure and pain, happiness and misery. But a plant on the edge of a desert is said to struggle for life against the drought, though more properly it should be said to be dependent upon the moisture. I do not believe, as we shall presently see, that all our dogs have descended from any one wild species. But, in the case of some other domestic races, there is presumptive, or even strong, evidence in favor of this view. Freedom of thought is best promoted by the gradual illumination of men's minds which follows from the advance of science. I am not apt to follow blindly the lead of other men. Only picture to yourself a nice soft wife on a sofa with good fire and books and music. What wretched doings come from the ardor of fame? The love of truth alone would never make one man attack another bitterly. The love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of man. To kill an error is as good a service as, and sometimes even better than, the establishing of a new truth or fact. I have always maintained that, excepting fools, men did not differ much in intellect, only in zeal and hard work. 
and I still think there is an eminently important difference. A moral being is one who is capable of reflecting on his past actions and their motives, of approving of some and disapproving of others. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, not the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I for one must be content to remain an agnostic. It is always advisable to perceive clearly our ignorance. Often a cold shudder has run through me, and I have asked myself whether I may have not devoted myself to a fantasy. The limit of man's knowledge in any subject possesses a high interest which is perhaps increased by its close neighborhood to the realms of imagination. The highest possible stage in moral culture is when we recognize that we ought to control our thoughts. We are not here concerned with hopes or fears, only with truth as far as our reason permits us to discover it. Such simple instincts as bees making a beehive could be sufficient to overthrow my whole theory. An American monkey, after getting drunk on brandy, would never touch it again, and thus is much wiser than most men. We are always slow in admitting any great change of which we do not see the intermediate steps. Blushing is the most peculiar and most human of all expressions. A scientific man ought to have no wishes, no affections, a mere heart of stone. In the long history of humankind, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. A fool can be recognized by two signs. He talks a lot about things that are useless to him, and speaks out about what he is not asked about. We must, however, acknowledge, as it seems to me, that man with all his noble qualities still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. If I had my life to live over again, I would make it a rule to read some poetry, listen to some music, and see some painting or drawing at least once a week, for perhaps the part of my brain now atrophied would then have been kept alive through life. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness.